Today's Tuesday, August 1st. It's the Bitcoin Day of Reckoning. We don't know what happened yet because we pre-record this. <laughs> now, we're sad to report that the repeal and replace vote in the Level 1 Studios has failed. Yeah, we were trying to replace Overwatch with PUBG as the official game, but... I thought we had the votes. <laughs> How did we not have the votes? Krista wasn't even there. I don't understand it. <laughs> First follow-up this week, Ajit Pai. So if you've been following the news the last couple of weeks, net neutrality is sort of a thing and sort of they're trying to undo it. But uh, the FCC has also been ignoring freedom of information requests, uh, not just requests about the nature of public submissions, the, the, the public comments on the repeal of net neutrality, but it turns out the FCC has been really busy. A lot of officials have been meeting with ISPs and companies, and the minutes of those meetings are subject to freedom of information requests. Now, if you remember the claimed DDoS attack that they suffered when there happened to be a John Oliver special explaining what was actually happening, they're like, no, 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 it wasn't overwhelming public outcry. It was a DDoS attack. And they're like, okay, show us any records that have to do with that. And they're like, we don't have them. There were no emails sent <laughs> about that topic. There were no logs. We have nothing. And now they're also not providing anything to do with how they've discussed with lobbyists or politicians or anybody in power about net neutrality. You know, if I didn't know any better, I would say that uh, the FCC is up to no good. I mean, they're not really wanting to be transparent. They're not really wanting to discuss the subject of meetings. And now their ISP, their provider, Akamai, who provides CDN services, also doesn't have logs of a DDoS attack. This, this does not look at all shady. <laughs> Seems like business as usual in the in the government. <laughs> I had such high hopes, such high high hopes. Also, I don't in know why you would have those? <laughs> kind of a follow up, but kind of new information. China has asked Apple to remove apps that help you establish a VPN or help you establish communications outside of China. Yeah, we of course we knew that China was cracking down on VPNs, but the story here is that Apple was like, "Yes, let us help you with that. Whatever you need, China." We don't care about your citizens' rights at all. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, if they didn't do that, they would be kicked out of China. They don't want that. They build things there. So, uh, I don't know if you could really, I mean, you can blame them, but, eh. <laughs> I like how China just faces these things head on. It's like, yeah. don't, your, don't your citizens have a right to know? Don't they have a right to information? No, 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 no. no. Yeah, you have to give it up. Like, there is something that you can respect about China when you compare it to the West in terms of like the West is always like behind your back trying to like, you know, sneakily pick your pocket and stop you from doing things. Like the FCC and, stuff. And China just walks up and smacks you in the face. <laughs> it's like, it's all out in the open. Yeah. I, and it's funny, the lawsuit with the FCC is basically just suing to make all that out in the open. Not that they're trying to stop it, not that it can be stopped, but it's like, hey, if you're going to do this, at least do it in the open, do it in public, do it in broad daylight because daylight is the best disinfectant. West Virginia, uh, speaking of things happening behind closed doors, so uh, the internet situation in West Virginia is fairly terrible, and people in legislature and people connected to small business have been working to change that, but the incumbent ISPs, the national ISPs, are not really happy about that, and so this article uh, from TechDirt is really talking about uh, the changes that they're <laughs> that they're trying to make, and then all of a sudden they got sued by the incumbents. They're like, no, 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 this is this is our terrible, you know, poop filled sandbox. You will not change it. Yeah, Frontier is the company that kind of like has West Virginia in its death grip. It's like, yes, we control all the information in West Virginia. So what they proposed was one of the things about stopping competition is it's like, okay. A new competitor has entered the market. You must adjust the the power poles and the infrastructure to give them room. And they're like, okay, we'll do that. It's going to take about a year. And <laughs> during that year, they would destroy that company in other ways. <laughs> so what they proposed was, listen, we're going to get a third party to do this. And it's always going to be the same third party. And they've already promised us they can do it in a month, <laughs> every time. And if they break anything, we'll pay for it. And so Frontier was like, no, we're going to sue you for that. That is unacceptable. We cannot allow that to happen. <laughs> oh, poor West Virginia. This is the state of things in America because, yeah, monopolies. 
Now, competition would be great, but the competition has already been extinguished by the laws that we have had for the last 20 or 30 years. And so it's like, yeah, yeah free market capitalism. Yes, that would have been great 30 years ago. Where were you 30 years ago? Yeah, that's a lot of people. Well, I don't know about a lot of people, but there are a, there's a non-zero amount of people in the comments that are like, net neutrality is bad because you're given more regulation. Yeah, okay, that's true. But this is the alternative. See, they're already at the top of the hill sniping <laughs> down at all the competitors. And it's, it's like you see with the, you know, the whole AMD thing. Like AMD is like, they, they got in there. They did it. And they're, they're trying to dethrone Intel. And Intel's like, well, we, Let's can't, play dirty. we can't beat you, but we can certainly try to put you out of business in other ways. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that's going on in the ISP world constantly. Now, we don't know that that's happening currently for a fact. But historically, there was an antitrust investigation in the EU. And then even before that, like there was this agreement in the 80s where Intel was like, yeah, we'll totally share the secrets of the 386 with you. And then they reneged on that contract. And AMD had to do their own 386 in a clean room. I mean... This has been a sort of a pattern of behavior. Oh, China. Again, China being upfront with things. They are forcing minorities to install uh, software for monitoring their stuff, specifically the Muslim minority. They're going to have to install spyware on their phones so China can keep an eye on what they're doing. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce this Muslim minority name, but there's like one city in China where all the Muslims are at. U Uyghur? Uyghur? We don't know. We're terrible. Nah. Somebody give us a phonetic pronunciation because we're scrubs. <laughs> so just in this one city where all the Muslims live, they've made it a rule. You must install their official Chinese app on your phone if you have a smartphone, which will dump your logs. It will monitor everything that you do. You know, it's like make sure where you are. It does all kinds of crazy stuff. It's the worst kind of spyware, but it's like state sanctioned spyware. And they're actually stopping people on the street to make sure they have it installed. And they're working with the ISPs to check. And if you don't have it installed and you're using WhatsApp or VPN, they're turning you off. <laughs> now, if this appalls you and bothers you, you should know that basically the same thing is happening in the West. It's just the infrastructure is being co-opted. Functionally, it is a semantic difference between what is happening in the East and what is happening in the West. Except what is happening in the East, I guess they're doing out in the open and what is happening in the West all too often has been done behind closed doors. Who knows? Who knows? Chinese government knows. <laughs> they know everything. Uh, and, and also, you know, you know what uh, Muslim uh, people in this particular city have in common with Trump protesters? Mm, basically the same thing. <laughs> well, uh, in this case, the protesters, they didn't know what was going to happen. So this is, this goes back to the inauguration. You remember the inauguration? There was all the leftists who were like, we're going to shut it down. And you had those plans to like use the stink bombs. Remember those? <laughs> so these people, once they were arrested, they didn't really like, what are we going to charge them with? Right. How do we, how can we prove that they were rioting and not protesting? How can we prove that they came here with this in mind? Well, the answer is hack into their phones. This is disturbing because a lot of the time, you know, when let's, I don't, I don't know what you call that. It's, I can't even think of it like an illustration. It's not, it's just uh, shit talking, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what to call it. It's like two people talk. It's like, yeah, we should totally do a thing. It's like when it comes time to actually do it, neither one of them are going to do it. So I feel like that a lot of these conversations are going to be taken out of uh, context and it's just going to be used like a blunt instrument against these people. I mean, if they've rioted, sure, yeah, absolutely charge them with a crime. But I think that probably, you know, it's like you join the Facebook group and it's like, well, you know, I'm not into rioting, guys, but. I would like to, you know, protect some of the stuff that we have now from being destroyed. Is that unreasonable? So if they break into these phones and if they argue these cases successfully, there is a, I think it's a little bit of prison time for these people Yeah, because it's like a conspiracy to riot rather than just a protest. Yeah. Also, some of these phones were hacked the next day yeah. because they're pulling uh, evidence of like, well, these phone calls happened the very next day and we monitored that and it's like whoa so you were you were past the lock in less than a day so keep that in mind don't take your phone okay here's just a pro tip if you're gonna rob somebody or you're gonna commit a crime of any kind or if you're gonna go to a protest don't take your phone that identifies you <laughs> don't take a driver's license all right there's 101 criminal 101 <laughs> Well, it's not even criminal 101. It's going to be citizenship 101 before it's too long. I mean, I don't know if anti-fraud counts as 
Like, I, I don't think we should have to tell you. It's like, don't throw rocks in people's windows. Don't steal stuff <laughs> that doesn't belong to you. You know, those kinds of things also apply here. But also don't get caught up in that kind of a mess because that can that can turn ugly really quickly. Especially when you've got a police force that's spraying you with pepper spray for no reason and that sort of thing. I mean, ugh, technology. Subverting technology. Speaking of technology subverting systems, I'm surprised this actually happened. But uh, India's transport minister has van, van, vowed to ban self-driving cars to save jobs. This doesn't surprise me at all. The first thing I thought about when I read this story... Have you seen those YouTube videos of the traffic in India where it's like oh, yeah, yeah. scooters and like, <laughs> can you imagine AI trying to <laughs> negotiate? It's just going to pull over to the side <laughs> of the road and cry. <laughs> but yeah, this guy, so most governments are embracing self-driving cars. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think the police forces and that side are going to hate them because it's like, how do you take it a self-driving car? <laughs> You're going to have to get that income somewhere else. That's a lot of money they bring in. But everybody else is kind of like, eh, that sounds good because we can totally control everybody and take away their freedom. Taking away freedom is always something government wants to do. <laughs> but in India, they're like, no, 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 we can't have this because it'll destroy the economy. Hmm. I guess a lot of people in India are around the delivery industry, taxis and that, that sort of thing. Yeah, it, it mentions that Lyft and Uber, India loves Lyft and Uber. But of course, both those companies eventually plan for it to be self-driving. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, both of those companies are all about the whole self-driving everything. It's very surprising. I would not be surprised if he reverses course. Uh, or maybe it's like there's a lottery system where they only introduce so many thousand or hundreds of thousands or whatever of self-driving vehicles per year to alleviate the problems. Because when you look at like things like eliminating a traffic intersection, it's like if you can be assured that all the cars are self-driving and they just sort of arrange themselves so they can go through an intersection at opposite speeds or in opposite directions at really high speed, that eliminates a huge amount of traffic problems. It's crazy. It's really nuts. You also have to wonder, I never thought about this, but like if you're an Uber driver and you're doing well at it and that's a major source of your income, like your primary job, how do you feel about every Uber press release being like, yeah, self-driving cars. We're not going to need people soon. <laughs> I wonder if they're using the driver's GPS data as part of the, the algorithms that learn so that Uber's very best drivers are helping teach the AI. <laughs> they're, they're training their H1Bs, <laughs> their H1Rs. <laughs> uh. Uh, you guys follow the Panama Papers thing? Remember that? It's been a long time since we mentioned that. That was that was sort of a, a law firm hack thing from a while ago. Well, a font has taken down, what is it, the Prime Minister of Pakistan? Yeah, and you think, a font? Well, how could a font do that? Well, it's real simple. The font didn't exist when the crime was committed, <laughs> but the evidence he's presenting is in that font. <laughs> it's like, no, no, I have all this documentation from that <laughs> period in time that proves that I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. Oops, so, wrong version of Microsoft Office was yeah, used. Yeah, it didn't exist till 2007, and his d documents are all dated 2005. So, bad news. Ouch. That's kind of rough. That's, that's, that's definitely not a good situation. Also, not well, a good situation. I think it is a good situation. <laughs> well, not a good situation for <laughs> Someone who's committed fraud is going to go to prison, maybe. <laughs> I'm surprised that, that that's how that turned out. I mean, you know, I don't know. It's rare, but it's nice. I was also surprised that uh, somebody in Sweden that was mishandling private information was fined a little bit, not a lot. It's like <laughs> half their salary for a month. Which was like eight grand. But the scope of this is incredible. <laughs> this was a vehicle database, but we're not talking about just cars here. We're talking about every jet, every car, every <laughs> ambulance, all the, like the driver's license. So you got everybody who drives anything, anything in Sweden, their photo, all of their information, everything was just dumped <laughs> and given out. Everybody. Since like 2013. And uh, it was even worse than that. Like there was some, uh, what do you call the, uh, where they relocate you after you witness? Witness relocation? Yeah, the witness, witness protection. Witness protection. <laughs> the witness protection list? Right out there in the <laughs> open. It's incredible. Uh, it's, fortunately, is there, is there much organized crime in Sweden? Like are we going to, are like severed horses' heads going to end up in people's beds uh, now? Or? I mean, they were, they were witnessing against somebody. <laughs> Uh, they also lost a lot of government data as well. Things like classified systems, their bridges and infrastructure and all that sort of stuff. But I think it's interesting. The Swedish news is like, yeah, we lost lots of classified data and weaknesses <laughs> to our infrastructure, but all the citizen data, the citizens data. Oh my goodness. We don't, we don't have that kind of value system in America apparently. So it's, yeah. it's just us. Like we're, we're the only people that are like, wow, this is really terrible. Nobody else is freaking out in America. So it's nice to see some people freak out in Sweden about the important stuff. Now the leader, 
do they have a president or a prime minister or whatever they've got? Uh, a lot of people were crying out to him as like, someone has to pay for this. And his response was, I have the utmost confidence in all of my people. <laughs> 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 what would have to happen for that confidence to be destroyed, I wonder? I think that the that, that might have been something lost in translation. The, the original Swedish, a better translation might have been, stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Oh, the U.S. has indicted a Russian mastermind of a four billion Bitcoin laundering scheme. This is BTCE, the BTCE yeah. website. So. If you've seen the maintenance, it's like, oh, they've been bound down for maintenance for a couple of days. It ain't maintenance. <laughs> this dude's going away forever. So they accused him of laundering money through BTCE. They're accusing him of being part of the whole Mount Gox thing. Oh yeah, the Mount Gox where the money disappeared. Apparently, he's has access to that wallet because. Yeah. The blockchain. And uh, some stuff with Trade Hill. He apparently used that as well to launder some of that money. So That was in San Francisco, I think. Uh, now, if you read between the lines, I think a lot of this is the American government being like, <laughs> you're operating a hugely successful cryptocurrency thing. We don't like cryptocurrency. We don't like you. You're Russian, and you're not paying us taxes. So you must go away forever. But there might be something to the whole fraud thing. I don't know. I don't know either. It, there's not really enough information to tell. On the one side, you could say that you know this was uh, an organization that was being used to launder money for criminal organizations, and this individual is involved in the criminal actions here to you know up to his eyeballs. Or you could also say that he was running a money exchange system, like a currency exchange, and you know, what people do with that, they don't know. Yeah, it and, was completely anonymous as designed, and unlike other. Uh, places where you can trade Bitcoin and stuff like that, the cryptos, he didn't ask a lot of questions. And that's not acceptable for the U.S. government. <laughs> he was arrested, I think, in Greece, in a little tiny village in Greece, which I thought was surprising as well. It's just like, oh, just hanging out, my private villa, you know, wherever. Yeah. Not a not a, an especially glitzy or, or glamorous corner of the globe. Uh, I'm surprised uh, that this kind of a reaction didn't happen for HSBC because didn't HSBC also launder like $4 billion? Not only did they launder a ton of money, but it went right, it, was, it was traced right back to the cartels. <laughs> it's like, there is no question. This was drug money. I mean, okay, so let's say he's into the, the Mount Gox thing. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a crime, right? But it's not the drug cartels from Mexico. <laughs> it's not the people who burn people alive and behead them and, and mail their head and feet to different places. So yeah, there's a little bit of a double standard. A little, <laughs> little, little bit, yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see how this story develops, and it's also interesting to see how anybody that does anything with cryptocurrency is demonized. Yeah, it's there. Well, the I mean, cryptocurrencies are definitely like an Achilles heel of the current banking system. If they catch on too much, that's trouble, and you got to do something about it. And it turns out they're trying to do a lot about it. <laughs> the SEC has just ruled that Ethereum and other, you know, cryptocurrency initial coin offering tokens are securities. So what, what's an initial coin offering, you say? <laughs> well, so that's not all the initial coin offerings. So initial coin offerings are where you can sort of buy shares in an app on the Ethereum network. All right. So they've got all these new things that are coming out and you can trade Ethereum to buy portions of it. So the SEC is saying, well, if that portion of a thing represents a company and pays a dividend or you know something like that, that sounds a lot like a security to us, and we run that. <laughs> you must apply and go through us, and it transcends international borders, and we will regulate this thing. Yeah. So this is a really interesting article just to have like the financial industry's take on this kind of thing. And the biggest thing is when you have this kind of security setup when your thing is a security no anonymity whatsoever every you, everybody on the board has to be named there has to be a power structure and there's all this red tape so a lot of the draw of the ICOs and stuff like that is taken away because you're no longer just you can't have this mysterious group doing a thing and it, it must it must be you have to lay it out you have to have a plan and I don't think a lot of those people do. <laughs> well, even laying it out and having a plan, just being not anonymous, uh, makes you a target for demonization if you believe that the, the people that are in power want to demonize cryptocurrency in general. Yeah. It's kind of rough. Oh, Ver Veritasium. Veritasium, am I saying that correctly? Yes. Uh, has uh, 8.4 million has been stolen. Uh, 8.4 million of Ethereum has been stolen from the Veritasium platform. 
So this is, uh, again, this is not the Ethereum network. This was another thing, and this was one of those ICOs where somebody got in and took the thing. And it was, it was a tiny percentage of what this thing was. This is Reggie Middleton. Reggie Middleton is like the Neil deGrasse Tyson of the financial world. <laughs> he's like a, they even look alike a lot, but he's, you know, he's like a really arrogant maverick kind of guy <laughs> with just you know, like a strongly educated black man. Everybody loves him. Well, not everybody, but he's a popular figure. And uh, he's claiming it's not a big deal and they're going to be fine, but it was, it was a lot of money. It is really interesting that this is apparently the third or fourth hack on this particular platform or this particular thing with, with Ethereum. Ethereum's a little bit more complicated because of the whole uh, yeah, contract software yeah. distributed distributed computing thing. Um, so it's a little bit more than we want to get into here on the news. But this is not the first hack of its kind. We've reported on on several of those, and there's there's quite a bit of, of interesting information in the details if you care to dive a little deeper. Yeah, Ethereum kind of gives you the ability to build your own apps on Ethereum. You know, like using it intrinsically and it seems like people are real bad at securing those so far <laughs> so before you jump into that you know it's you got to think when something can be directly monetized immediately the security will be tested to the nth degree <laughs> like you cannot cut any corners and these people are learning that quickly <laughs> Well, coming from the EU, we have a, a little bit of good news. Uh, the the German uh, German court, uh, top German court, has banned uh, usage of keyboard tracking software. So this is basically keyloggers. So basically, in Germany, employers are not allowed to use keyloggers, even on owned equipment, to keep an eye on their employees, citing employee privacy and you know the, the fact that people don't necessarily use even their work computers for totally work related stuff. This uh, there was a court case where someone was fired. And the reason given for their firing was they were working on a project for another company while at that company's workstation. And the person argued, you can't fire me for that because you shouldn't know I was doing it. And they won. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the court's reasoning, though, I think was, was more that it is a reasonable expectation that an employee would not have that kind of software on there. If there were other kinds of software for monitoring that you were doing work, sure. But that level of monitoring is intrusive yeah. and invasive. You have to assume that people might look at their bank login at work or, you know, text private things with loved ones or whatever. <laughs> uh, and there's going to be time, well, like maybe during my lunch break, I have to do some stuff that's private. So keylogger is pretty bad. <laughs> Dear wife, is it time to renew the prescription on the ass cream? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All your risky Amazon searches at work. Oh. <laughs> Well, the U.S. Army is seeking uh, help with the Internet of Battlefield things, distributed bot swarms. They're, they're working <laughs> on this, but then it's like, wait a minute, this crappy consumer technology could be taken out by a high school kid or you know somebody at DEF CON yeah. or something. The Internet of Battlefield things <laughs> is maybe one of the most terrifying phrases I've ever heard in my life. Because <laughs> you think about, like, okay, if the, somebody in Ukraine can take over all of the IP cameras and start turning off heat in buildings and DDoSing certain things and mess up the power plants and whatever. What can they do with battle robots? You know, it's, it's a, such a bad idea. This is a terrible, terrible idea, but you need battlefield communication. You need to be able to set up and take down a network in an instant and do it securely. And that technology doesn't exist, but there's a ton of consultants out there. They're going to make a ton of money prolonging <laughs> the problem. Now it is, one of the things that makes a lot of sense they're talking about in this proposal, maybe Internet of Battlefield Things is a bad way to put it, but there are sections around Russia where it's just like a totally dead zone for wireless communication. They're jamming everything. <laughs> so you can't get a drone in there. And the U.S. is kind of saying, well, we need to get on par with that. You know, We need to be able to fight those wars and counter that kind of technology. And that probably is a good idea. I mean, you know, you, you need to be on everybody else's level in terms of cyber warfare. But connecting everything to the internet is not the way to do that. We figured it out, chat. No, no, it's just, it's, no, this is, this is, you've got to fundamentally invent uh, new types of, of stuff to do this. And there are classified radio systems that will do this kind of thing, I'm sure. But, you know, modifying consumer drones to do this, this is, I don't, I don't know that this is the right way to do this. This is probably... It's probably a great way to have a 13-year-old, you know, accidentally do something bad and then 
And then it'll be, <laughs> oh, we need to regulate this or control it or whatever. What does this command do? Oh, that's a Hellfire missile. <laughs> it'll be like War Games, except with drones, and that'll be bad. War Games, the movie from 1983. So prescient. Oh, UK is going to require registration and safety tests for drone owners. Now, I would actually not be completely upset with this if they had previously required registration and training for remote control helicopter pilots or remote controlled aircraft pilots. This is anything over 250 grams, so that's pretty small. Yeah. So pretty much everything, any kind of drone, is now going to require registration. And of course, there's like, you know, their argument is anything above 250 grams can down a helicopter, they argue. Like a, <laughs> a helicopter traveling at high enough speed, if you ram into the windscreen, you could take it down. That's their argument. But wasn't that true of remote control helicopters in the 80s? I mean, you could get like a 40-pound remote control helicopter in the 1980s that was totally analog, no computer, and you could totally use that for terrible, terrible things. Is this a fundamentally different world that we live in? No. Switching gears a little bit to technology news. Isn't that why we're here? Technology news, all the really exciting technology, and not necessarily the technology that is going to be used to subvert our lives. We're educating you so that if you're ever in a position, it's like uh, Senator you know, so-and-so is like, what do you think about it, Billy Bob? You can be like, uh, Senator, you, no, this is dangerous territory. You're going, it's like, we, we outlaw crypto? You could sooner outlaw fire, and it's just as Promethean in the implications. It's totally fine. Well, Ryzen 3 is out, and uh, <laughs> Ryzen 3 from AMD, this is sort of the you know, around a hundred dollar processor and, you know, hot hardware here has got some benchmarks and some reviews and all sorts of fun stuff. I think, uh, I think even Paul from Paul's hardware did a whole bunch of testing on video with like 30 different games and it's looking pretty good. It's, it's, you know, four cores, no, no hyper threading. There's a couple of different CPUs that are available at 65 watt thermal design power. And, uh, it seems to give the i3 from Intel a run for its money in most scenarios. I don't think anybody was expecting this to take over the world or be super impressive, but again, for the money, for the value, it seems like a good deal. Yeah. If you want, uh, you know, you just want to build a simple system to play games and you don't want it to break the bank, you can get, uh, the real savings actually I think is in the motherboard, especially with the overclockability, because you can get a, a motherboard that's perfectly good for Ryzen 3 for around $80 US. Combine that with a uh, you know hundred to one hundred and fifty dollar Ryzen three CPU, and you've got a really uh, the basis of a really good gaming rig. You know it can add a a five fifty or five sixty, especially when like the uh, the miners stop buying up all the cards. You can get a really good value on one of those mid range graphics cards. That, that would make a great gaming system for most games, especially like ten eighty p medium medium low settings. I mean that's that's where most of the market is. That's where most people are today buying machines really neat of course at the very high end you've got the super enthusiasts and threadripper is upon us uh if you ordered an oem system like an a uh, alienware i think uh there's a couple other vendors i buy power uh you can totally get threadripper now or threadripper has actually already shipped it's going to be available in diy configurations pretty soon too and you're only going to pay like 150 percent margin for these <laughs> systems these prices man i <laughs> <laughs> I looked at these prices and it's just like, how, who buys these? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, well, it's hard to, I mean, for gaming, it's like, why, why would you buy this for gaming? Game, gaming alone. Gaming alone is, is not a good value for these. Well, what, what, in what scenario are these a good value? Uh, if you're going to warranty replace every piece of it, <laughs> maybe. If, you, if you're the kind of person who has to call support like 20 times a day, Maybe <laughs> anything less than that. These are insane prices. Yeah, you could totally DIY it and save a bundle. Of course, you can't DIY it yet. The DIY parts are coming out August 10th. If you're willing to pay this much <laughs> just to be the first to have it, wow, you got problems. <laughs> There's something wrong with you. Uh, some people like support. I mean, it's like, oh, I want support and warranty and <laughs> no, you, just DIY. Are you cripplingly lonely? <laughs> 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 Do you love the Indian accent? <laughs> Well, if you can't wait and, uh, you know, an alternative that we can give you that is uh, better than, you know, doing that, maybe if, if you just want it now would be the reason that you buy it. And that is you can check out MSI's uh, Threadripper installation video for how to install the CPU. There is a, uh, a nice video here. It sort of goes in this cartridge thing. This is a really interesting mechanism. I expected this to be much more complicated than it was because with, you know, the current LGA sockets, you basically just drop the CPU in. And that's really not great 
for uh, longevity. That's really not great for, you know, not accidentally damaging your CPU socket. But with this, yeah. you slide your CPU in and just sort of sandwich the whole thing together. It works. It looks like it works really well. Yeah, I think this is a way better system. I don't, I don't like it does. I don't see a lot of ways you could screw that up. <laughs> Can you think? I mean, maybe if you didn't get it all the way down and you really tried to like <laughs> cram it in there, but I put the thermal paste on the pins. It's not working. I don't understand. And also with this doesn't have the, uh, the locking mechanism like most modern CPUs. It's actually just got three screws, but you also like with the locking mechanism it was always like you had to put so much pressure, you know, and it was like, if that was in there backwards or something, you were definitely going to crush Crunch. it. And this doesn't seem to have that problem. So I think it's a good system. It's looking like it's going to be a really interesting, it's an interesting time to be alive for computer hardware. This is the first year in many years where we've got some really amazing things happening in the hardware industry, not just from Intel and, and AMD, but just across the board, interesting developments on hardware. This is going to be a really, really interesting year. Samsung is also shaking it up. Samsung has displaced Intel as the world's largest semiconductor maker. Yeah, and a lot of this, of course, you know, we've seen Intel with the whole chipset thing. They're not in a good spot. It looks like they're going to get slapped around pretty hard. <laughs> but this was before that. You know, we're talking about this. And so what they've done is they've not adapted to all the new technologies. They've not moved their R&D into mobile they're not looking at you know like ssd type stuff they're kind of focused on the desktop and it's killing them and samsung yeah. is like we're doing all these things <laughs> and we're doing them better than you and they're they're number one yeah samsung with arm samsung with flash now intel has got optane and optane looks like a really kick-ass super awesome technology that's in partnership i think with micron the price point and some other stuff intel has been really careful not to accidentally disrupt the existing market. And so I think somebody needs to tell them to, you know, come out of the kiddie end of the pool. They're going to have to really get their feet wet and they're really going to have to go sort of down and dirty with the whole flash-based versus Optane-based technology because Optane really looks like it's going to be the most amazing thing ever. But it's insanely expensive. And I don't think fabrication for Optane is as difficult as it is for Flash, although Flash has got a little bit more inertia than Optane. So it'll take some ramp-up time to get the production facilities underway and things like that. But there's, I'm going to guess and say that Intel doesn't get it with Optane because I know that Intel doesn't get it with the internet of things. Uh, internet has, uh, the internet, Intel's discontinued the Jewel Galileo and Edison product lines. This is Intel's foray into the internet of things. And this is like, this is a microcosm of how not to do things. Like if you look at how Intel handle internet of things, I am just some bozo. I have no special insight into what Intel is doing. I can look at this from the outside and be like, who thought this was a good idea? <laughs> they spent $2 million plus or minus, so the internet would have me believe, on a reality series for the web and, and television about the internet of things as powered by Intel. This is, you know, we're talking about people using Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and $5 worth of electronics to build these cool little internet of things things. And Intel came out with their own stuff that was like $150. And it's was like, well, $150 is, is pretty close to $35. Yeah. And when you're talking about Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi has the kind of popularity that Intel thought that they could generate by throwing money yeah. at this garbage. Yeah. And they, and rather than like at Raspberry Pi, the cool thing about it is like, hey, let's get it out there. Let's get it in everybody's hands. Yeah. Because when everybody has it, <laughs> then all of a sudden there's all this great support for it and libraries and it's it's easy to get into. It's easy to make it do what you want. And Intel didn't understand any of that. <laughs> no. And they were just like, you know what? Just spend a bunch of money on it. <laughs> Reality TV series will be the, the way to get people to take this up. It'll and this, this and the last story, this is a great example of how capitalism should work. When you get so big and so bloated and so out of touch with reality, you should fail. That's how it's designed to work. The old forest burns and the green shoots. The green shoots come up. And it's it's beautiful to watch this happening. Now, Intel is so powerful, though, like maybe they can stop it. And that would be sad because it would be great to see this dinosaur die and turn into oil for the rest of us. You know what else is really nice when you're working on stuff is documentation. So I've, I've got the Edison. I've got the Galileo. I've got all the stuff in the modules and things like that. It is great, wonderful, innovative hardware. The documentation was awful. 
I mean, it was beyond awful. There were some there were some black spots in the documentation on the Raspberry Pi. Don't get me wrong. There are proprietary components and binary blobs that go in the Raspberry Pi ecosystem. But the documentation was at least there. Or it was like, hey, here's the binary blob. Here's all the stuff at the border. It's like, I would like a list of registers in Galileo. Nope, sorry. Deal with it. It was just a lot of really nonsensical things that made absolutely no sense from the Intel side of thing. The Intel Edison, the post stamp size x86, so cool. <sighs> Intel, it, it really, it does pain me because those products could have been so great, but they were too expensive, not documented enough. And you, like you said, uh, the forest has to burn so that better things can, can maybe succeed. It's too bad that didn't happen sooner for Microsoft because Microsoft is finally adding reasonable support for Android phones to Windows. God, this is like 10 years overdue. <laughs> But I, I don't have any desire to link my Android phone up to Windows 10. <laughs> I'd like notifications. I would like some sort of notification system that doesn't go to the internet. So there's like there's a, some software that's called Pushbullet. Pushbullet is great and also extremely terrible because in order for it to do its thing, it's got to go to the internet and back. So it's like when I get a notification on Android, it's got to go to the internet and then back to a computer. That is so dumb. It should just use the local network for, for communication. I don't, I'm not comfortable with it going to the internet and back. That's just, I don't, I don't like that. It'd be like mouses without borders going to the internet and back to control my cursor. It's just so, it's so dumb. So dumb. The other thing that's really dumb about this is this is really, really platonic integration with your Android device. This isn't even like really good yet. This is going to be the basis of something that might not be terrible. But in terms of like, all of the stuff that I would like, it's not there yet. And it's, I, I, how, do, how do they not know what people want? Oh, they knew. But there was a little something called the Windows phone <laughs> that they were trying to make a thing for a very long time. And I guess they finally just were like, okay, it's not going to be a thing. <laughs> we're, okay, we're, we're, it's just, come on. <laughs> come on, Microsoft. Come on. Come on. This is just not. Really good. You know what else Microsoft is trying to make a thing? <laughs> the Windows App Store. Windows, the Windows App Store. So, when Windows 10 shipped, you didn't get Solitaire. Solitaire was a thing you had to go to the Windows Store to get because everybody spends a bunch of time in Solitaire. Eh, it doesn't have to come with Windows. Well, now they're trying to do the same thing with Paint. And so a bunch of people freaked out and they were like, what, they're removing Paint from Windows? And it's like, no, no, no. You just need to get Paint from the App Store. And so Microsoft has had to come out with this thing to be like, no, no, we still love MS Paint. We're not going to not include it. We just want you to get it from the App Store so that then we can say in our marketing analytics, Oh, we've got millions of people that are using the App Store when, in fact, no one cares. Well, it was also the, the bloated 3D paint thing. <laughs> so it's like, hey, here's a bunch of crap you don't want and you don't care about. And I, I think one of the things they overlooked here is like, who cares about paint, right? I mean, other than printing screenshots on a system that you've just installed, <laughs> what do you use paint for? And the answer is memes. <laughs> the most basic meme making is done with paint. All the, the, you know, the, the bottom tier meme makers <laughs> depend on this. You can't take it away from them. Microsoft didn't realize that. <laughs> the 3D paint you could kind of use with like a 3D printer. You could get some previews. There were some features of that that were kind of neat. But yeah, largely Microsoft has just completely missed the mark on this. Well, how many people have 3D printers? You know, <laughs> it's, it's unnecessary bloat. And the people, they won't usually rise up. But if you threaten their memes... <laughs> Torches and pitchforks. I really wish the Windows App Store was not a completely useless pile of crap. Like, if it was actually, like, okay, that would be pretty good. Like, can you imagine using the Windows App Store for making sure that, like, Adobe and Java is up to date? That would be amazing. But, no. That's just, it was not, it was not to be. The one reason that Microsoft is doing that is so that they can go to companies like Procter & Gamble and be like, hey, our platform, the Windows Store, is great. You should totally do stuff or go to Bethesda and be like, you should release your next title on the Windows Store because we've got these millions upon millions of you. We've got a billion users using this. Uh, no. Procter & Gamble is kind of wising up to that. This might be Adpocalypse 2.0. Uh, they've cut more than $100 million in largely ineffective digital ads. They said this was web ads, so this, this article gave me the impression this was like banner ads and, and that sort of thing. But $100 million, is this a sign of Adpocalypse 2.0? I don't know. Well, the important thing here is not that they chose not to spend $100 million. The important thing is they chose not to spend $100 million, and it barely moved the needle. They didn't suffer at all from giving up on all those ad dollars. So that tells them that no one cares about ads on the Internet. And uh, 
Uh, we can tell you for a fact. <laughs> Ain't nobody watching ads on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, adpocalypse is kind of a thing. Um, the, the, the thing is, though, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. It's like, did these companies create a situation with ads where users are so galvanized against advertising that they yeah. just don't see them because the ads are terrible? Or is it actually like organized crime and botnets and things like that milking these companies for money? Or a little of column A and a little of column B? We actually, so if you look at these stories that we switch to when we're doing this, we leave the ads on because we don't want to be like huge hypocrites and be like, you should watch ads on YouTube so we can get a few pennies and then have ad blocker in our browser that we show you. But we have so many tabs from all the news stories and all the horrible like autoplay videos in JavaScript it makes it nearly impossible to use Chrome with that many uh, tabs. Yes. And it's if you turn those off, turn the ads off, smooth as butter. <laughs> and it's just disgusting. It's like, we want to try and support you. We want to try and help you, but you make it so impossible because <laughs> they're so evil and they're tracking everything we do. We try to leave the ads in the video even, and it's like, oh, no, it's playing in the background. In fact, when we started recording the news, um, we didn't notice, but the we were also capturing desktop audio. And it was just, you know, a smorgasbord of like 40 or 50 audio ads on these various websites. And it's like, come yeah. on, guys. Like 30 tabs. It's just insane. <laughs> like, uh. Uh, Tesla, the Model 3 has finally been revealed. Now, Musk has always said the inside is going to be Spartan. But here is the inside. And boy, is it Spartan. Oh, this is, I, this is horrific. <laughs> this is the iCar. That's, that's what I'm seeing here. It's like... <laughs> I'm surprised. I'll be surprised if it has an ignition button. Does it? I mean, I know it doesn't ignite, <laughs> but does it have an on off? Is it when you sit down? Is it like, oh, I'm ready? <laughs> but so that screen, do you think that's a, a, a backlit? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So what happens when those bulbs go out? Uh, it's probably LEDs, and it's like you gotta, you gotta get a new car. It's like oh, it's 20 years from now. <laughs> <A new car>. <laughs> 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 or somebody uh, like leans into it the wrong way, or somebody bumps their head, or. Whatever. No, no, this this is pretty clear. I think Musk intends for even the Model 3 to be completely autonomous at some point within its service lifetime. But it's lifetime. not. It's not yet, no. Yeah, so in the meantime, suffer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And pretty you much. see that little speed display that's in the corner? <laughs> you have to take your eyes off the road to see that. I mean, this is supposed to be like the technological car. We have technology in cars that can heads-up display. On the windshield. On the windshield. Yeah. But we've chosen not only to not do that, but to move it from glance down to see it to you have to look down at the screen, <laughs> which is going to have other distractions. I wouldn't be surprised if it had ads. <laughs> yeah, ads in your car. All right. Woo. <laughs> this is a $35,000 car from Tesla, a $35,000 electric car. But um, I guess because they took everything out, they save on weight or something. It's also drive-by-wire, so that's a thing. At least I, I heard that it was drive-by-wire. I don't know if there's confirmation on that. And I suppose that uh, all of your cabin controls are integrated into that screen as well because oh, yeah. there's no buttons anywhere else. <laughs> it looked like there were tabs across the bottom. It's like, would you like GPS? Would you like you know, heating? Would you like to watch a movie? Because yeah. that's a thing. Now, I know that in other cars, modern cars, those screens disable themselves when you're moving at like five miles an hour. So it's like, no, no, no. You cannot touch screen when you're moving at this speed. That is not safe. <laughs> but Tesla's like, do whatever you want. <laughs> and it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's a bad design. It, it should be, you know, self-driving-ish. I mean, it'll make sense in the self-driving world, but not not when you've got a steering wheel that you're still expected to hold on to at all times. I don't know. Twitter. Th this is this is a non-story, but we thought we would include it because it's kind of fun to point and laugh at Twitter. Twitter did not add any new users, or at least in their reports, they reported the same number of users this quarter as last quarter, and a lot of people are freaking out about that. And and our Story is more about the people freaking out than Twitter reporting that they didn't add new users. Well, it is. It's indicative. I mean, if you if you're a company like that and you can't grow, and you don't generate money, <laughs> what do you do? Well, Twitter's never generated money. I mean, what, what else is does that there? make it better? <laughs> well, it's nothing new. I mean, you know. I think you're addicted to Twitter, <laughs> and you're defending it. But that that's not a sustainable business model. You must generate either money or interest. And right now, they're generating neither. Who is actually paying for Twitter? Like, do they... I don't, I don't understand. Are they just running up a bill somewhere? Like, somebody has to be paying for something. I, a lot of the... Some of the quotes in the article, the best quotes were like, you literally have a president 
who is waging war on your platform every day. You have the most interesting drama, the most interesting soap opera in the world going on <laughs> on your platform, and you can't bring in new users. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Speaking of centering things, uh, there, there's a 3D metal printer that is uh, 100x uh, faster and 10 times cheaper for 3D uh, metal centering, I guess. Uh, now, historically, this has been done with lasers, but this is not using lasers. This is just using really precise control of heated material and some other stuff to actually 3D print in metal. And that's what makes it so much cheaper and uh, easier to operate. Yeah, you buy cartridges of your metal of choice, and it comes in these little rods, and they're doped with some kind of other material so that it can print them. But then you bake that, and it shrinks. But your software compensates for that shrinking. It's like a shrinky dink, but it's metal. <laughs> and so it's like it builds it 50% bigger. You, What's the opposite of a shrinky dink? You bake it. <laughs> and... Uh, so that's really cool. And then, so you bake it and then you break it off its little stand and you have, it's also like 99% dense. So this is really strong. Like it's not some shitty little lattice work thing that's going to break. Now they do start at around 360 grand. So <laughs> probably not going to get one for your home, but yeah. they're hoping that the price will be down around 120 grand after a few years of production, but I, w I wouldn't count on it. The nice thing, though, is that there are laser-based systems right now, and if you want to buy one of the laser-based systems on the commercial market, it's going to be well over a million dollars. So we are talking about a significant cost reduction. I see some very, very scared politicians weighing in on this because <laughs> 3D-printed guns with this thing? Trivial. <laughs> people are going to freak out. You know what else people should be freaking out about? <laughs> Facebook building an alarm clock. Now this is this is not quite like the uh, Echo or you know Google's thing. This is more like we want to show you your messages and we want to ha you can have a chat on your nightstand or whatever. But what it has in common <laughs> a is chat on your nightstand. Yeah, what it has in common is it's always going to be listening. Can I get the Facebook thing with with Bixby? Because that that's going to be the game changer right there. I need I need that, but with Bixby, <laughs> you can emulate all the voices and you know personalities. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out because Elon Musk has called Zuckerberg out and says that his understanding of AI is limited. I can believe that. I'm no Musk fan, but I'm with him on this one. I, I that is not surprising to me at all. Uh, so Zuckerberg, so Musk, did we talk about that last week? We did a little Oh, yeah, bit. Musk is afraid of, like, the AI revolution and robots taking over, which, yeah, could happen, I suppose. <laughs> Maybe it's probably a little bit of an incendiary comment. Well, Zuckerberg sort of played it down, and he was like, no, 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 I support AI. And he's, he's you know, he shouldn't say things like that. <laughs> and so Musk's return on that was his, uh, his knowledge on the subject is limited. <laughs> it probably is. I can't explain in this tweet. You're just going to have to trust me. So, okay, <laughs> thanks. Not, not good. DEF CON is also happening. Well, DEF CON is probably over by the time the news airs, but DEF CON is happening, and there's all kinds of news coming out of DEF CON. The one that I guess has freaked the normies out the most is that uh, hackers have broken into voting machines in like 90 minutes, something like that. And these are these are voting machines that were, I think, in use in like Pennsylvania or somewhere. They had Diebold and one other big company. So these are like the in-production current voting machines because you can buy them in certain, you know, might even get them on eBay. And so these things, I don't know if they're going to be used again, but they were used in U.S. elections. <laughs> yeah, uh, and we're also talking about remote access. So from a hacker being on the same network as the voting machine to complete remote access in the voting machine was like a minute 30 seconds or something like that. Something just yeah. vanishingly small. They got them actually a variety of ways. Some of them have USB ports. Mm, bad idea. Some of them have Wi-Fi connections. Terrible idea. Some of them ran Windows XP. <laughs> Windows XP. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, there's no shortage of people who will tell you that the elections were rigged because these voting machines are so easy to manipulate. And I don't know about the elections being rigged, but the second part of that is definitely true. It's been proven. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This, uh, DEF CON is held in Vegas, and there's all kinds of stuff coming out of there. They're hacking the Internet of Things. They're hacking. It's like, oh, we need to root your Apple Watch. It can totally be done. There's all kinds of, of bad security things that are happening there. Why Vegas? Well, it's a little bit like a magic show, except they make security disappear, not the girl, I guess. 
something. You get good at cybersecurity, you can get a job. <laughs> People are hiring. Uh, <laughs> this is also a thing to come out of Vegas. I thought this was kind of funny. It's like, uh, we're looking for a senior threat analyst with uh, you know, strong whatever skills. And it's like, uh, okay, sounds good. Vegas is a good place to recruit for that at DEF CON because good Lord, the stuff that they've been hacking at DEF CON is completely nuts. Yeah, it's kind of a turnaround because traditionally these big companies were not believers in like let's hire the the, the weird Aspie maverick who can, scruffy nerf herders yeah who can figure all this stuff out let's hire the high-priced security company that can protect us right yeah no those people cannot protect you so they're actually getting into the habit of like okay let's find these guys let's give them money or let's give them a bounty or whatever and let's employ them to actually go in and hack us and find the holes so that we can plug them rather than depend on these useless security companies to protect us in some other way. <laughs> Another article we dug up this week was, uh, you know, smart guns where it's like only the owner can fire it. Nope. Turns out anybody with magnets can fire it. <laughs> now this is just one kind of smart gun. There's different kinds. This one uses a watch smartwatch counterpart. So the watch wirelessly communicates with the gun. And if the watch does not say that you can fire the gun, you can't fire the gun. Well, this one guy was able to beat it several different ways. He used magnets to allow it to shoot anytime. <laughs> he used a jammer to make it never shoot, no matter what, even if you have the watch. And that one is maybe the most scary to me because it's like if smart guns became a thing and they were all that and that was a simple thing to do to jam, every business in the world would jam. And they would advertise and be like, this is a gun-free zone. You can't fire a gun in here. And it's like, well, then you've nullified them. What's the point? <laughs> uh, speaking of things that maybe should have been thought through a little bit more, uh, a Wisconsin company is going to let you tag yourself with an RFID implant to buy snacks, open doors, that sort of thing. <laughs> Buying snacks. Like you can tell they're like, how can we convince them to do this? Let's offer them snacks. <laughs> and 50 people signed up immediately. <laughs> It's like, you know, I could totally just wear an RFID fob on my wrist or, you know, keep one in my wallet. No, I need an implant because yeah. I forget my wallet and wrist. So they're, do, they're doing the, the web between the thumb and a pointer finger and pretty standard stuff. People have been doing this for a long time, but this is kind of a big story because this company is like condoning it and paying for it and offering it. You just say yes and lay your hand down and boom, you've got your thing now, they've promised they won't use it for tracking where everybody is all day and <laughs> how long you spend in the bathroom and a variety of other horrible things that they could do, but nothing's going to stop them from doing those things. <laughs> nothing's going to stop uh, you know, third-party businesses from erecting RFID readers and doing that at a distance, I guess. Yeah, or you know, when you walk into the mall, it scans your RFID and it's like, oh, this person works at X <laughs> business. They probably have an income of X. Advertise to them appropriately. <laughs> now, in reality, it can be hard to detect RFID at distance and you know being able to read it, and there are things that come with that. But malls are already tracking your Wi-Fi MAC address and your Bluetooth MAC address and things like that to the extent that modern versions of Apple iOS, I think, randomize your wireless MAC address in an attempt to defeat that technology. It's just put it <laughs> put it in the door handle. Problem solved. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it's in the if it's in the door handle, it's like you got to wave your hand to open the door. It's like, no, oh, no, no. You're, don't even like you're still just... opening the door, <laughs> but it's reading as you reach. For the, who reaches for the door with their offhand? <laughs> Nobody. Yeah, it'd be like the security cameras the Walmart installed on the uh, sliding doors. They're at eye level, but they're like built into the door because they're real small. Because the ones that are overhead are not real good for seeing your face, but you didn't even notice. Now the next time you go to Walmart, you're gonna be like, oh my god, he was right. I don't know what I'm saying. Jeff Bezos was briefly the world's richest person. Very briefly. So, of course, <laughs> his income is based on the Amazon stock price. It hit $1,085 recently. Wow. Which jettisoned him over Bill Gates. <laughs> Immediately, the stock price fell back to like 1040 and he went back to number two. <laughs> we thought that was just worth a mention because it was he, like, yeah, richest person. Oh. <laughs> he dried his tears with $100 bills. <laughs> And then just crumpled him up and threw him away. He looks like a completely different person now. Have you than seen he did the? 10 years ago. Yeah, he looks like he's becoming a supervillain. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's more in shape, and like his head seems to have, maybe he's probably on HGH because uh, he's so rich. He's uh, he's getting ready for that presidential election run up like Lex Luthor. He's getting ready for living in the bunkers. 
<laughs> well, we've got a robot story this week. It's our it's our closer this week. There's a recycling robot named Clark that finds all kinds of different plastics and sorts them accordingly because recycling plastic, if you do it right, is actually kind of tricky. I was impressed by the speed. Was it 90 items per minute? Yeah, yeah. It was really, really insanely so fast. So that's, that's a lot. He has uh, suction cups and pincher arms. So you can just send him out into a landfill and he will sort 90 items per minute, which is pretty incredible. So he's like, he identifies, and I think there's some machine learning there too, where it's like, that's an orange juice carton. That should be recycled. And it's like, you can come and show him. It's like, look, Clark, this is also an orange juice carton. It's like, ah, oh, yes. <laughs> now, the, have you ever seen the, the documentaries? I think it's in Ghana, where there are whole cities that are based on e-waste. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you, how soon do you think there's going to be a robot? <laughs> where it's just like, don't, I don't... I don't think those cities can afford the robot. No, no, but th see, th you have to ship that stuff over there. That's not African e-waste. <laughs> So instead of shipping it over there, you just put it in a warehouse and send the robot in, and those cities don't matter anymore. We need that with television. So it turns out that there's a huge problem in America. The, uh, the old CRT televisions were too expensive to ship overseas, most of them. So there are some recycling centers that were like, yeah, well, it's cool. We'll just store the TVs until it becomes cost affordable to recycle a TV. That has never happened. So there are huge warehouses filled with tons of CRT TVs where the money was collected to recycle them. And they were never recycled. So this could solve that problem. Okay, so think about, you build a robot that has the power source and the learning ability, the, you know, the processing power, and the utensils, the tools to take apart a CRT television. <laughs> That's the first robot that if it goes rogue, we're, we're done. Because <laughs> think about, like, it could easily kill you, right? <laughs> yes. And it's going to have a, a power source so it can move around a lot. And it's going to be autonomous. That's the tipping point, and like, okay, if this one decides we all need to die, it's going to be a problem. I had an idea for a novel the other day. I'm not a, I'm not a fiction writer at all, so maybe the audience can pick this up and run with it. Or it may already exist, because I'm not a big fiction reader either. But uh, have, a, have a robot that, that this all happens, and they, they've already played out the scenario in their head, and so they instead go for like the gorilla method. And their gorilla method uh, is to engineer viruses to make us not completely awful people. <laughs> <laughs> so... It doesn't want to destroy us. It just wants to make us not completely awful people. But what I mean, wouldn't that be like the same end world AI scenario where it's like, well, I in tried. In order to make them not completely awful, you basically have to lobotomize them, you know. <laughs> and then they're just so they're just laying around using up resources. So I was thinking more like the, the the cat virus, like the toxoplasmosis virus, like a version of that where it's like. Oh, I should care more about the environment and go recycle those CRT TVs. <laughs> <laughs> but then they would stop making robots. Mm, that would be a problem. So you got to engineer that virus really carefully. Like, I need my robot companion to help me recycle those TVs, <laughs> but I'm going to feel like I'm in charge when, in fact, the robots are in charge. It's going to be great. Oh, this week should be interesting. We'll see you next week for more news. See ya.